moving on. Culture is both overt and covert. What we mean by this is that there are elements of culture that we are specifically taught, the overt, like how to eat with utensils or how to ride a bicycle. But there are also elements that are not taught. And a good example of this would be proxemics, and that's spelled P-R-O-X-E-M-I-C-S. And that refers to our personal bubble, how much space we need around our physical person. In the U.S., we have a large personal bubble. We don't like people to get near us unless we invite them. We don't like to stand smushed up against somebody in the bus. We don't like to sit by somebody we don't know in the movie theater. Um, it's just considered really bad manners, unless there's no other choice. <clears throat> We're not specifically taught that. We just pick it up through observation. And when we think about our culture, we think about it in its ideal form, uh, particularly the national culture. So for instance, when asked to describe the values of U.S. culture, people often mention equality, democracy, and freedom. The reality of U.S. culture is that there is not qu complete equality of citizens, and some people believe the U.S. only promotes democracy unequally across the globe. So again, you get that ideal versus the real culture. And all of the things we've talked about up to now contribute to our worldview, and which is a way of understanding how the world works and what our place is in it. Everyone has a worldview that impacts their perceptions and interpretations of events that occur in their lives. Some people think everyone else interprets or sees things the same way they do. This is referred to as naive realism. And I think we all start out this way, but through education, our naive, naive realism goes away as we learn about other people's perspectives. And in effect, our culture is changing. Now, cultures can change in a number of ways. The only way new cultural traits emerge is through the process of discovery and invention. Uh, someone perceives a need and invents something to meet that need is one of the ways that occurs. Seems a simple enough concept, however, it often takes a long time for a new invention to be totally integrated into a culture. Why? Well, because other elements of the culture have to catch up with the invention. And this is referred to as culture lag. And we can use the automobile as an example. What else had to change to make the automobile really efficient? Well, roads had to be constructed. A way to procure fuel had to be developed. Mechanics had to be trained. Um, how to produce the cars efficiently had to be uh, figured out. Safety concerns, rules of the road, insurance, numerous other elements had to catch up with the invention of the automobile. We could do the same thing for the internet, but I'll let you think about that one on your own. The next way cultures change is through diffusion, and this is simply the borrowing of traits. And we could come up with a long laundry list of things we have in the U.S. that were borrowed from other cultures. For instance, pajamas came to the U.S. via India, um, but that would take a really long time. What I would recommend is that you read an article, it's called 100% American, it was written in uh, several decades ago by Ralph Linton and is classic in anthropology. Uh, you can find a link to it in the week three course materials page. It's really worth a read. <clears throat> the last thing we want to talk about is acculturation. Acculturation is also the borrowing of traits. However, there is a superordinate or dominant and subordinate relationship between cultures. The dominant culture picks and chooses those traits that it deems useful. The subordinate culture is pressured to adopt the traits of the dominant culture. Now this does differ from how your textbook discovers a culture or discusses acculturation, but we're going to use this more specific approach to the concept. Now acculturation can happen in different ways. One is called the melting pot, a term you're most likely familiar with. Uh, the melting pot refers to a blending of cultures, and this primarily occurs through intermarriage of people from the two cultures. What usually happens is that one of the cultures is dominant and the other subordinate, so that only some of its traits are practiced. Another form of acculturation is called the salad bowl, or cultural pluralism. This occurs when people immigrate and keep many of their original traits. Chinatown in San Francisco is a good example of the salad bowl. Um, now there still is going to be melting pot occurring as people have to adopt some of the traits of the host country. For instance, they have to follow the laws. But they keep their most important uh, characteristics. <coughs> host conformity is kind of the end result of acculturation, is total assimilation into the dominant society where people pretty much give up their original culture. And that is it for our lecture on culture.